Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for showing up to this uh, very interesting session, we hope. Um, so this is about CNS and drug development. And uh, as we all know, in the CNS arena, there's been a pause, uh, especially in psychiatry, for developing new medicines, also in neurology, in important diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Now, we do see some significant movements. Uh, we see movements in technologies, biomarkers, and we also see movements in uh, certainly the interest in, in the psychiatry area, most recently uh, where significant deals like the uh, acquisition of Cerebral by Abvi and the acquisition of Karuna by uh, BMS, which indicates new players in the field. So at this uh, symposium, we would like uh, to, with our distinguished panel here, to discuss some of the developments in the area and how we can hopefully uh, use this uh, traction and momentum that we see in the neuroscience area at the moment to leverage new medicines uh, for the patients. So a short introduction, um, Christian Thompson, uh, head of uh, BDNL at Bayer Ingelheim, I've uh, been with the company for five years, uh, background in neuroscience and, and drug discovery from various companies. And with that, I will introduce, uh, let the other members introduce themselves. So Georgia, if you would take off. Hello, I'm Georgia. I'm at the Dementia Discovery Fund. So we are a venture capital fund uh, focused exclusively on investing in companies developing novel disease modifying therapeutics for dementia. Um, so I will take the opportunity to let our panelists introduce each other, each other themselves. So Anna. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Annalisa Pichelulerka. I'm heading up business development in urology at UCB. UCB has two areas of interest. One is immunology, which we will ignore for today. But neurology, that is what it is about. And we are in epilepsy, neuroinflammation, and neurodegeneration, and neuromuscular disorders. And um, thank you for the invitation. Hello, I'm Carlos Buesa, I'm CEO and founder of Horizon Genomics, a publicly listed company based in Barcelona and Boston. Uh, we are developing um, a, a program in CNS based on an epigenetic approach and a chromatin and dimethylase. It's a novel mechanism of action. Um, LSD1 has an important role in the CNS biology, and I think in the discussion today, we might have the opportunity to discuss how this uh, particular uh, program might fit on the personalized medicine approach where we know that in, in certain uh, genetically driven disorders, LFD1 inhibition might play an important role. And also in uh, the classical all-in um, uh, neuropsychiatric clinical development where we are being, uh, the, where we are developing this drug for schizophrenia and, and borderline personality disorder. So thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Klaus. Um, I'm the CEO of Andrea. I'm a physician by training. I uh, spent 18 years in uh, Big Pharma, including eight years as Chief Medical Officer at, at Beringer uh, and also Faring Pharmaceuticals. So the Big Pharma world and I'm spending three years in the much smaller world of venture capital. I'm a venture partner at, at Andy Capital, a US Switzerland based venture capital fund. And I'm CEO of, uh, of Andrea. Enjoy the much smaller world a lot, I have to say. So Andrea is a uh, platform company, soon to be a clinical stage um, biotech company. Our lead compound is a CNS compound uh, with a dual mode of action with an immediate improvement of cognitive function, but then also long-term disease mod modifying effects, including neural inflammation, mitochondrial function. So this panel will be also very interesting for me to listen to my uh, esteemed fellow chairs and, and panel members. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Lynn Durham. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Stalikla. Uh, we are uh, a Swiss uh, and European-based precision neuro uh, company with uh, late-stage clinical assets. We have two verticals. Our first vertical uh, is uh, precision neurodevelopment uh, with uh, two assets uh, currently uh, being prepared to enter into phase two uh, this year for defined subpopulations of uh, patients with autism spectrum disorder. So it's a, it's a new uh, space.
space uh, in uh, precision but in psychiatry and a new subspace uh, in precision psychiatry. And we have a second uh, vertical uh, to the company around our uh, phase three ready MGUR5 uh, NAM asset that we in licensed from Novartis 18 months ago. Um, the company uh, is uh, advancing these late stage assets. Uh, we've been financed by the, uh, the NIH quite substantially with a 45 million equity financing to date and 30 million coming from the US government to advance our, our late stage. Uh, asset. Uh, we're really uh, optimistic about uh, the precision uh, neurospace with the recent uh, Cerevel, Karuna, uh, Alto uh, listings. We're really seeing the, the space uh, change. We've been in it for the last seven years when precision neuro was not a thing. And uh, yes, we're, we're, we're very eager to see how things are going to be moving forward in that space. Hi, I'm Stacey Lindborg. I'm a co-CEO of Brainstorm Cell Therapeutics, which is a publicly traded on NASDAQ um, late stage clinical company. Um, we are developing innovative autologous cell therapy treatments. Um, we're uh, based, we have offices in the US and also in Israel. Um, I've been with the company for four years and um, the technology is very exciting. It's using mesenchymal stem cells. Um, and playing to the inherent strengths of uh, MSCs and the immunomodulatory effects that occur. And then also through the um, manufacturing of our product, Neuron, which also is a platform play, um, allows us to secrete very high levels, our cells secrete very high levels of neurotrophic factors. And um, I have spent um, 28 years um, studying different uh, CNS products and have had the honor of working on um, a wider range, uh, array of products, including um, Nusenersen for uh, um, SMA, um, spinal muscular atrophy, um, working for a number on a number of different um, MS products, bringing them to the market, and um, also in psychiatry with Zyprexa. Um, and uh, different indications. So um, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm very excited about the potential in CNS and um, the opportunities that I think we'll be able to, to give some perspective on in terms of emergence of biomarkers, the importance of different modalities. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Great, thank you everyone. So as Christian mentioned, what we'd really like to cover today is ways in which the CNS community can capitalize on the recent momentum and interest um, to really push drug development and uh, clinical outcomes forward. I think a pretty obvious place to start is the use of biomarkers, both from the perspective of drug development, but also improving clinical outcomes. Um, I think Lynn, given your dedication to precision, precision neuroscience, it'd be great to start with you and hear your thoughts on uh, what are the considerations for developing biomarkers for CNS indications? I think um, obviously uh, biomarkers are uh, changing the space uh, and you're well positioned, Georgia, to know that uh, it, it has been a, a game change uh, in the neurodegeneration space where we're really starting to see uh, which pa patients can most benefit from uh, which modalities. In the neuropsychiatry space, the change has been more recent, although quite exciting. I think the, the first uh, uh, true biomarkers uh, that we've, uh, we've been seeing uh, are reaching a, a advanced clinical proof of concept uh, in neuropsychiatry are actually uh, uh, EEG uh, uh, based biomarkers with uh, um, players such as uh, Alto, who have shown uh, a clear uh, correlation between um, specific uh, EEG uh, profiles uh, in uh, to predict uh, treatment response in uh, treatment resistant uh, depression, and that was uh, the uh, the starting point for uh, their successful uh, public listing a few a few months ago with very impressive results. 
results and also um, the capacity to to rapidly accelerate uh, existing uh, modalities in specific uh, subpopulations. Then um, uh, separately uh, or um, adjunctly, uh, we are seeing a different type of biomarker development modalities in the uh, neuropsychiatry uh, space uh, with um, clinical development uh, being uh, operated uh, with um, uh, biomarker uh, efforts uh, in uh, patient uh, in patient recruitment. So, for instance, uh, several companies, including our own at Stalikla, have been operating a large uh, biosampling observational studies where the goal is not necessarily to develop a companion diagnostic because we know that in the psychiatry uh, arena, this is not always clinically uh, uh, practi uh, practicable, but uh, the goal is to develop uh, in, in parallel to a patient clustering and phenotypical definition or identification or characterization of the patients, uh, a discovery uh, effort that will closely correlate uh, blood-based biomarkers with uh, behavioral and non-behavioral phenotypical features that can serve as a basis for approval by the psychiatric committee. So that's where we're seeing uh, the biomarker space, I would say, in CNS as a whole, uh, with uh, a pure uh, a play, uh, blood-based or imagery-based uh, biomarkers in the neurodegeneration space and uh, uh, EEG and uh, discovery recruitment efforts uh, in the neuropsychiatry space. And you touched slightly on the uh, recent uh, regulatory flexibility, um, particularly in neurodegeneration. So I was wondering if you know the panel had any thoughts on how the field can capitalize on those sorts of pathways, um, which type of surrogate endpoints um, could be used, um, noting particularly uh, the use of NFL for the deferson approval, and whether or not this is applicable to other uh, neurodegenerative and also other CNS indications. Um, and Stacey, it'd be great if you could kick, up, yeah. kick us I, off on that one. I, I'd love to start. And I do think, um, you know, when we reflect on the importance of biomarkers and the goals, I mean, Lynn described, I think, very well, they can serve us in many different ways. However, when we really start thinking about um, that a regulator would be willing to make a decision to approve a product, um, this is one of the most critical aspects that, um, that a, a biomarker can play. And truly, when you think about then what it brings, so to first and as an example, um, for those of you um, who aren't familiar, um, if you go back even just two years ago, um, there was a congressional hearing in the US and a very senior position in CEDAR that spoke about um, ALS as a disease was not ready for um, the use of a biomarker in an approval. There wasn't a confidence level. And then just two short years later, Toversin was approved um, as a product um, for uh, patients that have SOD1 mutations. And, um, and based on accelerated approval with neurofilament light, which is a marker of neuronal integrity and um, marker of cell death. And that reinvigorates, I think, um, it brings a confidence level to certainly a measurement. When we look at um, our own product from a phase three trial, we had um, neurofilament light data that shows a very steady decline with neuron-treated participants compared to placebo. Um, that corroborates clinical data. It brings um, a confidence level that we can begin to understand the depth depth of information. And I do think we're certainly seeing, while biomarkers have lagged behind other disease and therapeutic areas where they're easier to access and assess, um, there are very real examples that are very exciting. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on what are some of the important considerations for um, companies, both pharma and young biotech, when they're thinking about this possible regulatory pathway, um, the use of accelerated approval with a surrogate endpoint. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I think that we have to be collecting data. We need to be collecting, in our case, we had seven distinct time points that we collected CSF. Um, we collected um, blood-based uh, um, samples as well. I think that we're constantly learning as a scientific community, and we need to certainly be able to go back and look at bank samples and understand what they, what they provide for us. 
Um, I don't know that you necessarily start out often. Drug development is not typically very linear. Um, so, you know, when you see the field advancing, you'd really like to be able to um, to then bring the, the most cutting edge science forward. And those discussions sometimes emerge very late um, in the process. Um, so um, it, it is uh, important to always keep in mind of as much information, especially very quantitative, very objective, um, is uh, extremely helpful in, in your conversations. Okay, thanks. Um, and now uh, maybe to switch gears a little bit. Um, with the recent approvals in the uh, CNIS arena, also uh, more to come, uh, likely we will shift towards more combination approaches, especially in neurology. Um, and I, that, of course, bring advantages, but certainly some challenges. And I wanted to hear, Anna, from your perspective and UCB, uh, how do you see that uh, field is, is panning out and what we can do to basically facilitate the implementation of such an approach. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the question is, what is the combination therapy, if I may ask? Because, I mean, most of the drugs being used in, in neurology indications, whether it's epilepsy or also neurodegenerative disorders, are used as adjunctive treatments. Right? So you have a baseline therapy of standard of care medication, and then you test your new compounds on top of that, which is not truly a combination, but um, it's, it's really poorly pharmacy um, use, right? So um, this is what we, I think, we already do. If you really want to, um, to do combination therapy trials like in oncology is being done, then you need to have a different um, setup and maybe even longer and, and broader trials, right, which is definitely a challenge. Um, I mean, when thinking about neuro in neurology and especially also neurodegeneration, what is definitely the case if you look at the recently approved um, A-beta therapeutics, and then maybe hopefully at some point in time, and we are contributing to that, maybe even tau, anti-tau therapeutics, there may be, you may need to look at the patient journey in order to understand when to use which um, mechanism, right? So you may want to start with um, a beta at an earlier phase in the, the patient journey, and then you may switch to, to other mechanisms like tau um, in, in the progression of the patient in, the, in, its, in his or her journey. So um, it's definitely worthwhile to consider combination therapies. For example, we have in uh, myostina gravis, Neuroinflammation uh, is the headline for that one. We have two modalities or two different mechanistic approaches in order to approach these patients with an um, anti FTRN antibody or C5 complement inhibitor, which is a peptide. So, also, this could be combined, but these trials are really complex. So, you need to really understand how to design those, right? So, uh, certainly, and, and of course, a further complexity adding one drug on another is the potential for drug drug interaction and other kind of complications. And I wonder, Carlos, if you maybe have a few comments on, on that based on your experience. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, we, we have a molecule that we, we have dose of right now uh, uh, about 500 patients, more or less. And, um, and we have seen on the real world, I mean, the, the, the the need and the challenges of, of of making those kind of combinations we see in oncology in oncology right now is is the is the motto i mean uh, you you see leukemia patients being treated with a combination of drugs um, uh, same thing for solid tumors and i think in in the cns we are going to slowly going to to go to to probably to the same place but uh, combining medications um, requires a number of things i mean the safety profile and you, you need to, I mean, as a starting point, you need to have a molecule which has a known or very little drug drug interactions, um, which are basically, um, uh, which is basically having a proper pharmacology to apply with a population that um, we shouldn't forget. And I mean, uh, psychiatric population is a, is a population which is polymedicated. Very often they are over, over prescribed. So, um, I mean, this is the real world. And if we want to um, to get uh, to get to this point, we need to face the real world. In in uh, we have finalized just a, a few weeks ago 
we were showing the top line data of our phase 2B trial in, in borderline personality disorder. And we were presenting the top line data in, in, uh, at the GP Morgan. And, uh, and I think it's a, it's a good example of that because besides the efficacy readout uh, that, that we have got, which are very interesting, by the way, uh, what we have seen is that the, this was, we, we were liking to call this trial a sort of real world, uh, real world clinical trial because we were allowing comorbidities, we were allowing concomitant meds under certain circumstances and with certain criteria. Well, but I mean, uh, at the end of the day, the safety data of our compound is basically exactly the same or even better than the placebo, than the placebo arm. And I think that this, that's the, the, the reality check. When you, when you want to, to see if your compound is going to be able to combine with other compounds in a polymedicated population, I think this is something that you, you need to take in, into account. Okay, thanks. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, when you mentioning psychiatry, we have usually traditionally the DSM-5 classification, now moving over to more of an ad hoc principle, more looking across symptoms that goes across different indications. Uh, this may call for an underlying biology where the common disease biology actually might be similar. And uh, Klaus, in, in your company, I think you have some experience in this regard, and maybe you could comment on how you see that moving forward. Yeah, no, first of all, I'm a big fan of precision medicine because it gives us the opportunity to identify populations that may have a better benefit risk profile because we have a, uh, an approach that's, that's specifically geared to them. Um, I, I just think it's important to not lose sight of the fact that there could be pathways, um, pathophysiologies that um, address um, patients across disease areas, and you mentioned you know, ardor and that there's the symptomatology, but uh, to give you a concrete example is uh, neuroinflammation. So we've known for a long time that Alzheimer's has a degree of neuroinflammation, but we learn more and more that this is the case also in other entities like major depressive disorder, a traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, etc. So wouldn't it be great to have a, an orally available brain penetrant uh, internal inflammatory drug that's safe and that we can test across indications whether a reduction of new inflammation can have benefit. Um, so um, that's why we're excited, Vandia, that we at least in mice have such a compound and we could be in the clinic in a few months and hopefully we can show the same uh, in human subjects. But uh, when we had the, the pre-call, I think Lynn made a great point that the two concepts are actually not mutually exclusive. Um, so if we have a you know, an anti-neuroinflammatory drug, it won't benefit all patients with Alzheimer's or all patients with traumatic brain injury. Again, we, there we need to look at uh, subpopulations where the inflammation is driving the phenotype. Uh, in other Alzheimer's patients, it may be the, the poor education, it may be the poor brain metabolism that we have to tackle. So the two are not mutually exclusive, and I think there's a role for both for kind of broader pathways and new information is just one example. Another one is, as I mentioned, you know, improved brain metabolism that, again, may have benefit across the disease areas. But uh, so I think there's, there's a place for both. I just would be afraid if we always focus on small subpopulations, distinct mutations, et cetera. I think we also need to pursue these broader pathways uh, and then combine it with precision medicine, but in a different kind of uh, way. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thinking about the, uh, this kind of approach also implemented into the clinical uh, trial setting, uh, this is something that also has you know, certainly some challenges. Um, and Carlos, maybe this is something that you can comment on how you see that from, for example, using schizophrenia as an example and how you can basically try to, to leverage this approach. Um, yeah, well, I, I would like to also to to go on this uh, on this kind of comments from from Lean on the pre, pre on the pre call and 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 from Klaus here. I mean, I, I think that schizophrenia, for instance, is um is a very interesting example on how you can combine both worlds: the, the world of the whole in. Uh, I mean, just based on preclinical models, uh, all all of us cognizant on how poorly translatable and predictable are these preclinical models and the, um, the precision medicine approach. We, we, we know, in, for instance, that in schizophrenia there, are, there is a specific gene uh, which has been so far the only one uh, categorized as the, probably the more um, serious candidate to, to make people prone to, this, to, to develop uh, schizophrenia, which is uh, D1A, an histone methyltransferase. I mean, 
uh, methylation of histones is really very deeply embedded on the biology uh, and the underlying biology of neurodegeneration and neuropsychiatry. But I mean, the interesting thing is that uh, there are populations uh, where we know that this, um, this gene um, uh, has a prevalence of mutation, which is very high. And this is the population, for instance, of the, the Amish population on the, on the Pennsylvania community. So the ones that we have seen on these movies from Harrison Ford and everything. Um, so these guys have a prevalence of um, a loss of function. So one of the alleles of cd one a is gone. And, um, and uh, what we have been doing there is basically studying, uh, we have completed um, an observational study to, to see how these people compare to other schizophrenia people and how these people compare the homozygotes, the heterozygotes, and, and, the, and, the, um, uh, uh, and the full mutants. So to, to see uh, um, uh, how that compares and how that could inform in a specific trial of um, schizophrenia on this population. Of course, this is a, a, a kind of two ways going back, no? because um, you might learn something of the molecular etiopathology of the schizophrenia by studying this population. Probably this is not going to be translatable to the whole population, but it still is, is, is amazing that LSD1 inhibition can affect this kind of very holistic model and can affect the models which are mimicking this particular mutation. So I, I think that this kind of uh, duality, this kind of di dialogue between varieties of autism, varieties of schizophrenia, where we know a genetic cause, where we know that we can do a much more targeted approach looking for the smoking gun of the etiop etiopathology, that this is something which is lacking on all the neuropsychiatric disorders, that can be very interesting and can be very informative. Thank you. Um, so now maybe switching gears a little bit, but still in the theme of combination approaches. So of course, what we talked about now is putting one drug at top of another drug, but there's also the possibility of uh, combining other modalities, not necessarily small molecules, but also completely new treatments, cell therapy, et cetera, et cetera. And Stacey, maybe this is something that you could comment on from, from your perspective. Yeah, I'd love to. And um, actually, one thought about just that came into my mind, because um, we've touched on Alzheimer's a number of times. And I think from a biomarker standpoint, you know, we get really excited about the surrogate marker. But I think actually, when you look at the PET ligand, we have several of them now that really help bring precision to enrolling the right patients. You know, so if you have a product that's removing a beta plaque, you, you need to target patients that, of course, have that manifestation. And I think the advances that we've seen with some of the more recent approvals are because of those, those pet ligands. So just one, one comment. Um, in terms of um, combination drug treatments and really thinking about um, diseases um, where you have a great um, knowledge of, of perhaps the genetic underpinnings, ALIS would not be an example of that. It's an incredibly heterogeneous disease. Less than 10% of the cases actually have um, a familial or genetic form, and those are coming from more than 30 genes um, that are known to date. So it's an incredibly challenging arena. Um, we know that um, certainly of the products that exist today, there are three approved in the U.S. for a broad ALS indication. Um, each of these um, are widely understood to really be managing symptoms um, and not disease modifying in nature. And so the experts in the field really believe that um, we will have to follow um, a path like oncology and combine, you know, this is a fatal, universally fatal illness. We need to be putting what we can um, as quickly as we can in patients and seeing if we can maintain quality of life. And this is a place where different modalities, I think, become, becomes very important. Uh, and specifically, you know, in autologous cell therapy, which is cells coming from a person being put back into a person in very large numbers, um, you have an ability then for um, 
a lot of the safety concerns that can come with um, with um, allogeneic um, treatments and um, perhaps rejection or other other factors. Actually, there's a huge amount known in ALS in particular. In the literature, there are about a thousand patients that have been studied in mesenchymal stem cells, and um, really we see very mild side effects, very short-lived. So it makes it for an ideal um, combination with other, other treatments. Um, Neuron, as an example of a, of a novel um, uh, autologous cell therapy um, is unique in its mechanism compared to all of the the treatments that are um, that are approved today. So you have an ability. Um, uh, Klaus, you talked about the importance of really being able to dial down and address inflammation, which is also a chronic um, hallmark of ALS, as well as then increasing the the neurotrophic support. So you bring those two things combined, and um, and this this combination. In fact, we're we're doing um, in real life in a real world setting in our our next phase three trial. We will allow standard of care any product that anybody is on. We'll be learning in real time. We, of course, stratify based on um, the product that's the, the most recent, and we'll make sure we're um, carefully thinking about what this tells us about um, our product. But it, it does provide um, a, an assumption of really a very clean ability to go in and actually assess now what, what can multiple therapeutics do for this disease. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and, and some of the considerations, of course, is also when bringing a drug to the market, it's also basically uh, how to achieve uh, adequate pricing in order to get return of, of all the investments uh, that are made. And, and for combination of process, of course, ha you have to prove improvement over standard of care. So maybe, Anna, could you uh, share a few comments uh, from your perspective on how you see that environment developing? Yes, yeah, sure, I can. I mean, there are really two pair of shoes, right? One is what is required in order to get regulatory approval by FDA or EMA. That's one thing. The other thing is when you um, look into how to defend a good price or how to negotiate a good price, especially in Europe um, these days, that's a completely different um, set of information that you need to provide and, and what we have seen by going through this process recently is that you need to really have a good understanding on that early on because it will definitely influence your clinical development and uh, what you may be aware of is that we are as of next year are going to have a centralized um, HTA process in Europe which requires and this is a staged thing depending on, on the, 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 the disease area, let's say. Um, and that then even will require that you consider that very early on in the development. And especially in Europe, um, it's a challenge because you will need to, to uh, show your benefit um, um, based on standard of care. And as you may know, um, standard of care may look very differently in different countries in Europe, right? Whether you look at Ger Germany or maybe Poland or the Nordics whatsoever. So that will be something that will influence our thinking when it comes to trial design and also on how we put the arguments together to defend our prices. Um, and what also needs to be compared, and that is what we hear when talking also to biotech companies, when it comes to the question, what is your competition, is that often we will then have explanations around um, competition using the same mechanism of action. But when it comes to pricing, it's not about the same mechanism of action. It's about what is available for these patients, what is being used for these patients. And that is really something. So standard of care is, is really what is being used for the patients and not what is similar to what do I have. And, and that is really something that is very important to consider. And I think um, the industry will need to digest now these new um, centralized um, HDA ambitions that the EU has in order to, to be successful then not only to achieve regulatory approval, but also commercial viability, let's say. Um, and that, that is very important. Plus, maybe if I may, one point when it comes to disease modification, 
you need to show that, right? So it's not um, only about showing symptomatic treatment. I use now as an example seizures. So it's not just reducing um, seizure um, frequency, but if you want to in a DEE, for example, if you really want to show modification of the disease, you also look at, look, need to look at behavioral endpoints, cognitive imp impairment endpoints, and so on. So you need to have all these different endpoints available in order to convince that your drug is disease modifying. Thank you, Anna. And I think that was a very nice segue over to the next topic, which uh, Georgia will introduce. Yeah, so continuing to discuss the money, um, we started this panel by talking about how recent uh, regulatory clinical successes had spurred strategic and investor interest in the space. But given the unique challenges of CNS drug discovery um, and also the clinical path, particularly for neurodegenerative disorders where the endpoints are very messy, you need large and long trials, it does still remain challenging for companies to raise money to fund these programs. Um, so, Klaus, I'd love to get your thoughts on if you think the financing arena is changing for um, CNS companies and, and also uh, what you feel the biggest challenges are and ways to overcome them. So, yeah, I've had time, time will back about two years when we started discussions on our Series A. It was a bit frustrating. Um, we are a platform company, so we have a CNS, a muscle, a liver and lung pro uh, program. Um, we, we are most excited about the CNS program, it's also the most advanced, but we were told, you know, CNS is really not so hot at the moment. Um, it's a graveyard uh, of, uh, of, of lost opportunities, especially in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. A graveyard with very expensive tombstones, as Georgia alluded to, because, you know, a phase three can cost $200 million. So, um, but yes, it, it has changed. Uh, we learned that uh, at uh, partner conferences last year, and even maybe more so uh, at JP Morgan this year, that people feel it, uh, the, the area is back. It's the second largest area. There's maybe a little bit of saturation in the oncology. Um, so, so pharma investors are looking more now to, to the CNS areas than they did two years ago. And it's also spurned by, as you mentioned, Georgia, a couple of recent approvals. But it still remains a challenging area, right? I mean. You know, most of us startups, we are uh, funded by VC funds. They want to see a reasonable time frame to an exit. Uh, a phase three in, in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease doesn't fit into that picture. And I think um, at least a partial answer to that is um, biomarkers, as we discussed. Um, there's more and more acceptance. And I think Stacy made the point uh, on, on filament. And also, you know, it's not only CSF and bloodborne biomarkers, it's also the imaging markers, as you mentioned, Stacy, and some, uh, you know, the elaborate ones that Selig is, is looking at. So if there's a growing acceptance of biomarkers, then that gives us more reason to believe for pharma and investors that hey if we have a you know real run phase two or maybe even phase two a and we have a significant impact on a more and more accepted biomarker then that can be you know lead to an exit and and can be can be attractive and there's not a week at the moment that passes where we see new exciting data on biomarkers so just last week we saw the um the new england journal pub publication where Chinese group showed that 18 years before the overt diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, certain biomarks in the CSF changes. So, um, and then there's more and more changes as, as, as we um, uh, go on. We see the much better sensitivity now of, of blood-derived biomarkers. We don't always have to have CSF, and that'll help us in clinical development. So uh, I think there's uh, uh, room for optimism. First, the CNS area getting more the forefront of attention of VC funds again, of pharma, and then we're getting more and more tools uh, and more regulatory acceptance that we don't always need a 2,000 patient, you know, one and a half, two year clinical trial to, to get a, you know, a reason to believe that this is going to be a successful drug in the market. I think that'll help us uh, going forward. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Lynn, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic as well, given uh, your company's focus and use of biomarkers. Yes, so um, I, Klaus sort of um, alluded both to biomarkers uh, being uh, a tool to uh, 
uh, to advance or to uh, to to obtain uh, VC funding with uh, earlier uh, readouts, uh, uh, including with phase two A uh, a proof of concepts uh, uh, and adjunct biomarkers that sort of can. Uh, um, equivalent to a former phase 2B with uh, with a larger uh, uh, or smaller ends required than uh, than with a 2B. So so yeah, that these are strategies. Then uh, uh, outside of the pure uh, uh, biomarker topic, facilitating financing in this return of CNS with uh, with new uh, modalities being approved and uh, uh, yeah, a precision uh, CNS neuropsychiatry space. I think that. Um, there's there's also um um, there, there, there's also the uh, the and I'm, or, I mean, COVID is starting to be uh, long past, but there still is, uh, from a political standpoint, uh, the uh, the aftermath uh, of of uh, COVID resulting in uh, uh, upsurge of uh, of, uh, of mental health uh, issues. I'm alluding here to substance use disorders and uh, a major crisis uh, in the in the U.S. and that uh, has uh, allowed in specific sub arenas of psychiatry to see a uh, very large uh, government funding specifically in the US which has been an opportunity for um, for multiple companies essentially in the US and a few uh, companies in Europe operating in the uh, neuropsychiatry space so i would say dual uh, a biomarker driven uh, uh, earlier uh, uh, readouts that give more confidence to investors and uh, also on specific modalities that have uh, social political uh, impact, uh, a large funding uh, in the uh, US, large public funding. Good. Um, yes, we still have more topics, but uh, since we uh, not have so much time left, we just wanted to hear if there's any questions from the audience that uh, we could address or the panel can address. That's one down there. How does it feel as the panel so far? Uh, one topic that hasn't been touched yet is the challenge that preclinical models are often very difficult and not really super valuable in this space. So how would you convince investors or farm partners um, when you don't yet have a clinical proof concept? Do you want to answer it? Yeah, I, I can I give it a shot. So. Um, Yes, we all seen these wonderful results in, in mice, and I presented some a little earlier today. Uh, but we always hear, yeah, you know, there's so much stuff that works in mice and then doesn't work in humans. So an excellent question. And um, I think what we and others have tried to do is like, if we have a specific molecular target to come up with genetic association data that correlates it to human disease. Um, and again, there's more and more tools out there. It's just, for me, it was a revelation of what's publicly available that you can, if you have a good bioinformatician at hand, which luckily we have at, uh, in Lausanne, that you can you can deep dive, you dig, and you can find very interesting associations. And that was a very important tool to, invest con to, to convince investors that, you know, this is not only for mice, this could also be in humans. You still have to eventually, obviously, show it in clinical trials, and a genetic association per se doesn't mean it's it's necessary. I mean, we've seen all the difficulties with A beta, right? I mean, it's what a greatly validated target, right? So the APP mutations, the Down syndrome, et cetera. And then still it took like, I don't know, 20 years for a drug to be approved. But that's at least one avenue to say, you know, this is not only for, for mice. There's also a link between our pathway, our mode of action, our molecular target, and human disease that we see across several databases. Um, but that's just, I think, one thought. Yeah, if I can add on to this, they're not only mice uh, that can qualify as preclinical models. Uh, we actually started with preclinical data from patient-derived cell lines, so we were not treating patients, but we wanted to show that if we stratified patients, uh, we were seeing uh, uh, different bioprofiles, and we were then testing our drugs uh, on these patient-derived cell lines, and we saw a specific response in enriched population patient-derived cell lines versus uh, absence of response in non-enriched patient-derived cell lines with the same DSM-5 diagnosis 
uh, versus controls. So that can be quite cost effective as well. With regards to animal models, it's it's a mixed story. If you're tar targeting monogenetic uh, disorders, uh, as uh, uh, Carlos is at Orison, it makes sense. Then, and it's not because it doesn't translate into the clinic then that the model is not valid because clinical development is intrinsically risky. So it's always difficult to define what is the cause uh, of a failure. Then um, in, in Fragile X, for example, which is a, a longstanding monogenetic model of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, um, there has been difficulty to translate uh, preclinical mouse models into uh, uh, human results. But more recently, with um, EEG companion diagnostic development, we are seeing translation of uh, PD4D uh, modality uh, treatments in Fragile X into patient populations with a successful phase two. So the answer is very mixed. Great, thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Hello, I was wondering if you had any uh, uh, thoughts regarding the recent blood therapy on the inflammatory inhibition in the brain and the link <laughs> to uh, weight loss and the uh, uh, and the head to head comparison with GLP antagonists. Uh, what do you think that might do uh, to the CNS field? And particularly the, the potential of information in the field. Klaus, will you, the information expert, comment on this? <laughs> um, not sure I would call myself a, a new information expert, but I, I didn't get the one part of the question where we said um, you know, the comparative. Sure, I have a good answer for that. It's a, it's a very interesting one. So um, you know, I alluded to the to the to the role of, of inflammation, neuroinflammation. I mean, we also see that um, outside of the brain, right? We understand now that adipose tissue has a chronic inflammation, um, and that people with a lot of visceral fat and, and in chronic uh, inflammation of, of, of visceral fat then have a higher risk of, of dementia and, and, and other diseases. So there's a lot of interlink. Um, I'm not sure I can specifically answer on NLP3 and inflammasome and how that uh, translates to GLP-1. But it's just, again, it's a, a reminder how complex human physiology is and uh, that inflammation is a, you know, uh, an important entity. I mean, we have a group at, um, uh, at the uh, Schulfen Lausanne that does whole body PET imaging and they can correlate the level of inflammation with biologic age. Um, so it, it, it really is an important parameter. And uh, as I said, maybe a, a, an orally available, safe, brain penetrant anti-inflammatory drug can have roles beyond Alzheimer's and may have may also tackle uh, systemic diseases and it may go beyond uh, uh, obesity. And, and maybe one more comment on the complexity. We now see that GLP-1s may not only have a positive effect on obesity, but there's also data maybe on other um, um, yeah, desire disorders, uh, etc. So it, um, um, that's why it's so much fun to be in this field, right? Because we learn new things every week, as I said, and uh, that, you know, it it's opens up a lot of questions, but hopefully we also find some answers going forward. Okay, I think we have two minutes left, so time for one more question down there in the room. Thank you. Uh, two. Thank you. Uh, two questions. The first is how do you see the influence of all this effort in, in silico brain research? I'm uh, thinking about blue brain, and open brain, brain uh, 
uh, brain. I mean, this is thank you for the last one here. How they come into fruition in uh, in the current time and uh, in where it's coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second question is, where do you see progress in drug delivery in uh, in CNS and more specifically in region protected by the drug delivery barrier? Maybe just for neurodevelopmental disorders, I think organoids um, are interesting, but they're not prime time. Uh, and um, they generate interesting papers that will probably nourish uh, future uh, uh, discovery and modalities. But for now, um, we, we saw a lot of enthusiasm around uh, organoids uh, like five, seven years ago, and, uh, and we're not seeing direct translation uh, in, uh, in, uh, in clinical development for now. And that, I insist on the word for now. I can briefly add to that. We have a collaboration with, with Harvard, who also have an in silico approach, and they actually test a lot of natural compounds, uh, uh, drugs that are on the market for repurposing, and um, are now designing clinical trials to validate um, uh, that, that hypothesis that comes from those in silico approaches. But like Lynn, I think it's it's uh, it needs some very convincing data to get ready for for prime time. So I think we're not there, but clearly it's an interesting approach if if you can use those organoids in in silico and then really demonstrate demonstrate that, that this can be validated, that would be fascinating and open up a new avenue for, for uh, drug development. Don't worry about the timing. Thank Good. You Good. All right, great. Then take uh, the last question. Thanks. Um, so, it struck me when you said that uh, we're starting to see biomarkers 18 years before the appearance of symptoms of the neurodegenerative disease. And, you know, I started thinking with companies like AC Immune, which is a client of mine, um, they already have active immunotherapies or vaccines in development, right? So, how far are we from a world in which we're starting to see? <laughs> focus shift decision prevention. Um, if you, you know, there are your phase two. If we have those biomarkers appearing now, you know, in five to ten years, we could be talking about prevention as opposed to treating neurodegenerative disease. Or, or do you think that's a wild, wildly optimistic view? That would be the ideal. The question is um, how to find the patients when they are not symptomatic because most of the patients don't go to get checked, right? Just for the sake of it. So that's true, uh, or, or it depends on where you look at throughout the world. Maybe that's true for. I, Western I, European countries where you have your your uh, healthcare providers or your insurances forcing you to do that, right? So there need to be an incentive, yeah. I think. Um, the thing is, there's only an incentive to go and have a checkup and do um, really um, get a diagnosis or do imaging or whatsoever to have biomarker tested if it has a consequence, right? So if prevention medicine is broadly available, then the population may be thinking or being ready to even consider that if there is no consequence for you and no understanding, then it may be uh, difficult. I mean, what AC Immune is doing, you mentioned them, um, that would be kind of a vaccination, right, against tau or alpha synuclein which may be a, a model because that is also, um, or should at least not be too expensive, right? If you need to have a continuous, I don't know, a treatment like with an A-beta antibody, right? This will be far too costly in order to do that uh, 20 years before you have first symptoms. So, so 
Uh, I'd just like to offer a slightly more optimistic view. I think we will get there. Um, the question is, how long is it going to take and, and, and who's going to pay for it? I think the last point you, you, you made uh, is very important. Um, but we have these biomarkers, or we're getting there. Um, we just talked about that it's possible now in the blood. We don't need CSF. Um, you mentioned um, um, uh, cancer. We now have the liquid biopsies. Okay, there's still questions to be answered, but uh, maybe we'll be able to identify cancer patients so early that we then have an uh, immune oncology drug that you know quickly takes care of that. And for Alzheimer's disease, yes, if we can, the bloodborne biomarker um, can identify patients and. But then we need an affordable treatment because you know society at the moment or payers would not be willing to you know pay a huge uh, or, or pay the therapy a preventive therapy for a large amount of uh, of people for for a very expensive therapy. So there's questions to be answered. Um, I'm optimistic we at some point will will find the, the tools and the, the solutions to get there. But it's it's unfortunately I believe in a quite a distant future. The other thing I would add is really just taking advantage of information that we have genetically. So somebody mentioned earlier Down syndrome. You know, you have um, a, a part of our um, population that every single person with Down syndrome will, de will develop Alzheimer's disease in the same plaque manifestations. And so, you know, when you think about um, not trying to conquer with a really b broad um, public screening program versus really looking at information where we know that, um, and we know a lot about how early and uh, when symptoms are developed. So I, I do think that we'll be uh, really very, um, we'll grow and learn and hopefully we'll be able to leverage uh, information that allows us to be very targeted in our in our pursuits. I think some of these comments, I mean, are, are um, that we all made are aspirational. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we need to be cognizant where we stand in terms of evidence. I mean, when you mentioned PSA, I mean, uh, PSA is using as a triage right now because we have tons, tons of clinical and biochemical evidence of the relation between P PSA and prostate cancer. I don't think that we have such an evidence from a beta with Alzheimer's. So we have inferences, we have population, population studies. The Fundación Pascual Maragall in Barcelona is making now a super, uh, huge study on, on healthy population. We don't have the data yet. So we don't know how many patients are really developing Alzheimer's because of a beta. We don't know if, it's, if a beta is the only etiology. So we, 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 we lack evidence, we lack data. So we need to keep working on that. So I, I think it's... it's I mean, it's, it's, time to time it's, it's, it's useful to, to, to go down to earth and, and to be realistic. And, and I don't think that, uh, um, well, thinking that the payers or the public systems in Europe are going to pay massive preventative uh, treatments without a very, very, very solid evidence is realistic. I mean, uh, and we are not there yet. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the, uh, on behalf of Georgia and I, the panelists, and in especially also the audience for their insightful and stimulating questions. Thanks again. Thank you.